young woman was preparing a ham dinner. After she had uh, finished making preparation, she cut off the end of the ham, put it in a pan. Her friend asked, well, why do you cut off the end of the ham? She goes, I, I really don't know, but my mom always did it. I just thought you're supposed to. So later that day, the young lady is talking to her mom and said, Mom, always when you made a ham dinner, why did you cut off the end of the ham? Her mom goes, well, that's the way my mom did it. So I just thought that's what you do. A few weeks later, that same young woman is visiting her grandmother and said, Grandma, why did you always cut off the end of the ham? And her grandmother looked at her and said, Sweetie, I only had a pan this big, so I always had to cut off the end of the ham in order to get it in my pan. Would you turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 14 to see Jesus' reply to the ham-slicing traditionalist. Luke chapter 14. And here's question number one. Why should you prioritize people above tradition? And number two, what should you do when you meet people who prioritize tradition over people? And we come upon individuals like that. What should your response be to those folks? Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Now it happened. As he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus, answering, spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent. And he took him and healed him and let him go. Then he answered them, saying, Which of you, having a donkey or an ox that has, that has fallen into a pit, will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. Let's look to the Lord in prayer together. Father, I thank you that your son came to reveal the heart of the invisible God to us. We come to understand who you are as a result of the choices of your son and the things that he did. And, Father, we live in a world that's given a tradition. And, Father, sadly, many times, tradition takes priority over people. Teach us, Lord, how to put things in the right order and please you and to reveal, as your son did, the nature of the invisible God to this lost and dying world. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus was invited by a man of stature to have a meal with him after the synagogue service. First one says, now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath. It was uh, customary to host guests at your home for a pre-prepared <laughs> meal on the Sabbath. You couldn't work on the Sabbath, right? So you had to make that food preparation early, and you would host guests. Now, the individual that had done the hosting was a ruler of the Pharisees. That could mean he was a ruler of a synagogue, or maybe even had a greater position as a member of the Sanhedrin, if you will, the Jewish Supreme Court. Needless, the reason they gathered together was to eat bread on the Sabbath, it's interesting to me because Luke is a very compassionate man. And he reports Jesus healing, and wouldn't a doctor be interested in healing, on the Sabbath more than any other gospel writer. You recall with me back in Luke chapter 6, there was the man with the withered hand, and Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. And then when you spring forward to chapter 13, the woman who had been traumatized, could not stand up erect, 
For over 18 years that had been afflicted by Satan, Jesus healed her, knowing the opposition that he would get at that time. Luke records these events. There's, uh, the, this is, by the way, the fourth time that he records a conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders on the Sabbath. It's important because Jesus is making a statement by the choices that he makes. This is now the seventh time, everyone, or there are actually maybe even seven times before this. This might be the eighth, where Jesus myths the religious community because of what he does on the Sabbath. Back in Luke 4, he cast out a demon. They were mad at him. Now, now think about that for a moment. Can you imagine someone being demon-possessed, and because Jesus had cast out the demon on the Sabbath day, they're mad at him? He healed Peter's mother-in-law on the Sabbath day, Luke 4. He allowed his disciples to pluck heads of grain on the Sabbath day. Chapter 6, he healed a lame man in John chapter 5 on a Sabbath day. He healed a man with a paralyzed hand. That's the fifth occasion. The sixth was the crippled woman I just spoke about just a moment ago from Luke 13. And then he, he healed a man that was born blind, number seven, on the Sabbath day. Now we're introduced in verse 2 to a certain man who is before him who had dropsy. And I know what you're asking. What in the world is dropsy? It's comprised of two Greek words, which means water in the face. If I gave you the term maybe edema, you would recognize it. It's a condition characterized by excess of watery fluid collecting in the cavities and the tissues of the body. Could be caused by kidney problems. Could be also by a liver ailment. And also as a result of cancer. So it was serious. It was serious at this time. And uh, I'm, I'm so intrigued here because I think this man most likely is a plant. The religious community didn't care about him. They invited him to the meal because they knew Jesus was coming so they could watch and see what Jesus would do. They're seeking an occasion in order to attack once again the Lord Jesus Christ. Because notice at the end of verse 1, then they watched him closely. They're watching Jesus carefully. To watch gives us the word warden. It's the idea of someone who is guarding prisoners. The compound Greek word carries the idea of someone that is under surveillance. Same word occurs in Luke 6, 7, and the scribes and the Pharisees watching him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath that they might find an accusation against him. Jesus is amazing. He strikes preemptively. Because look at the wording in verse 3. And Jesus answering. He anticipated their unspoken question. They hadn't said anything to him. <laughs> but notice this. He spoke to the lawyers. That would be the experts in the law. And the Pharisees. And by the way, it's one article in the Greek. Lumps both groups together. And he asks them. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And what's your response in verse 4? Nothing. They kept silent. To be still, to be quiet. And I love what Jesus does. And he took him, healed him, and let him go. John says it this way about the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, what are you? Free indeed. Point number one, prioritize people over tradition, which demonstrates you love God. Prioritize people over tradition, which demonstrates you love God. What's the issue with the religious leaders? What is their challenge that 
They put a man that is a plant in order to entrap Jesus and apparently didn't care about that man's condition. They revealed that their hearts were not right with God and they did not love the true God by virtue of how they treated this one man. I want to take you on a little tour. And let's see together if we can discover what the problem is concerning the hearts of the religious community. Mark chapter 3. Would you go there, please? You're in Luke. Just go before. Mark chapter 3. We'll pick it up in verse 1. Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. We want to look at three passages in Mark, and let's see if we can find a point of commonality whereby Mark reveals the issue of the religious community. It says in verse 1, he entered the synagogue, again, this is most likely Capernaum, going back to chapter 2, verse 1, and a man was there. It's a continuous action in the past time verb. He was continually there. This was a man who apparently faithfully worshipped God, who had a withered hand. He was paralyzed, verse 2. And they, this would be described in the Pharisees, we learn that from Luke 6, 7, they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the day, the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. Then he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. Literally, he says, come to the middle of the room. I want everyone to see what I'm about to do. Now, could Jesus have healed this man on any other day? Yeah. He picks this day. He's making a statement because he recognizes the issue that the religious hierarchy has. And after he tells the man, commands him to rise, come to the middle, verse 4. Then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? And what happens once again? Because he hits them right where they live in their hearts, they kept silent. So when he had looked around at them with anger, now can you imagine Jesus' gazing eyes just singling out the people, one by one, looking at them. That's what he does. He looked around at them with anger, but he's grieved, and here's the reason why he's grieved, by the hardness of their hearts. The word hardness means a piece of rock. They're callous. They're blind. They care more about their tradition than they do people. Can I ask you a question? You care more about having a daily devotion than you do people or showing up at church on Sunday or attending Sunday school than meeting the needs of the people. Individuals can fall into tradition where all those things are good, but yet forget about the people. He was grieved because of the hardness of their hearts. So what does he do? He says to the man in the middle of the room, stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. And you say, okay, pastor, I get it. The religious hierarchy had Hardness of heart. But let me ask you a question. How soft, how pliable is your heart? Flip a few pages, Mark chapter 6. Jesus has been training his disciples, and he now allows them to participate in their first miracle with him. He feeds the 5,000. Get some fish, some loaves of bread. John 6 shows us that as the disciples kept coming back to Jesus to dole out the fish and the bread, he just kept giving it to them. Could have been 10 or 15,000 people fed on this occasion. It's extraordinary. But notice the first word of verse 45, after defeating the 5,000, it says, immediately 
He made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Why immediately? Well, John 6 tells us in verse 15 that the people wanted to make Jesus a king. Now, didn't he come to present himself as a king? Didn't he come to say, I am the king of the Jews? Yeah. But are they looking for a savior? No, they're looking for someone that is going to feed them for length of days. Missionaries used to call them rice Christians, individuals who would say and do anything in order to get some food. Now, Jesus isn't seduced by this, but he's concerned about his disciples because they're constantly having this debate, who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus goes, if they come and try to make me king, my disciples are going to join in the parade, and they would love, they would love to be treated that way, because that's what they were all about. So immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude and when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Interesting. He fought to have time with his father. He made sure that even as he sends his disciples, and this almost seems kind of sneaky, everybody, puts them in a boat, pushes them out into the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and he knows that the storm is coming. And he is up on a mountain. And by the way, when your storms come, when you don't have enough money to meet the objective, when you're having health challenges, when you're having, if you will, issues with a neighbor or a boss, it's almost as if the Lord takes you out in the middle of the boat, in the boat, and puts you out in the middle of the water and says, go ahead, go at it. That's what he's doing here. Verse 48, then he saw them straining at rowing. <laughs> How long should you be out in the boat for? What should be the duration of the financial challenge? How long do I need to deal with that coworker or boss? What is the time frame that my health is going to be bad? He knows. He's watching them. He's up on a mountain, and can I suggest something to you? He's praying for them. He ever lives to make intercession for us. He's prayed for them regularly. And as you are out in the midst of the storm, when you're straining at rowing, knowing that he has prescribed for you that exact challenge, he's praying. For notice it says the wind was against them. <laughs> and about the fourth watch, if this is Roman time, 3 to 6 a.m., of the night he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. The words describe a theophany. In the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, chapter 33, in 1 Kings, it's when God revealed himself the people. If Jesus is walking on the water, what's he doing? But you and I have an issue. We go through the storm and we look at the wind. We watch the waves. We look at the circumstances. What do they need to be focused on? The Lord Jesus Christ. They needed to look under the author and the finisher of their faith. They needed to see him, and I want to share this with you. If you will look for him in the middle of the storm, he'll show you who he is, and he'll display his power to you. He would have passed him by, and when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, a phantasm is the Greek word, a phantom. And they cried out. These weren't any wimps, experienced fishermen who had been out on the Sea of Galilee perhaps thousands of times, and they're scared to death. For they all saw him and were troubled, and immediately he talked with them and said to them, be of good cheer. Remember those words? 
These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In this world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome. He says, it is I, ago a me, statement of deity, do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled, for they had not understood about the loaves, because their heart was what? Hardened. Not just the religious community, but even his own disciples. How often have you witnessed the power of God? You walk outside and you see the sun. At night, you observe the moon. You see the stellar bodies. You look at that beautiful sunset, and you go, God is awesome. How often have you had a need that only the Almighty could meet? And He condescends to your level somehow intervenes in your life and meets your need and provides for everything that you need. And yet the next day, when something seemingly goes wrong, you go, what am I going to do? And your eyes, instead of looking unto the offering the finisher of your faith, is again focused on the wind and the waves and the storm. How many of us this morning can say, guilty? We've all been there. That is our issue. For they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. If he could provide for 15 or 20,000 people, then most certainly he could protect them. When they were in the boat by his choice, going to the destination that he had sent. But now they have a rock heart. Number three, Mark chapter eight. Flip the page. Mark chapter eight, let your eyes come down to verse 14. And, and, and here's really what I want you to ask yourselves. Do I doubt his power? Do I question his ability to provide for me? You name the area. To keep a roof over your head and bread on your table? You name the area. To bring the right kind of spouse to you that will honor you and love you as you deserve to be loved and honored? You name the area. To take care of your children. To provide and protect for them when you know you're just not in a position to do it. You name the area for your educational needs, when you are over your heads because you go, I don't know, I'm going to do this. You name the area. Do we have hard hearts and really doubt that the God who made the universe, who fashioned me perfectly, the one I can go, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Do we doubt him? Do we have a hard heart and we go, I just can't trust him? In Mark chapter 8, down in verse 14, now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Literally, the Greek says they forgot to take loaves. No problem, the bread of life is in the boat. And they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Isn't that enough? How much multiplication has he done in the past? 5,000 fed, 4,000 fed, and how about you? How many times? Then he charged him, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, the teaching of those groups. So they reasoned among themselves, saying, Is it because we have no bread? And Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? And here's the question, and here's the question for you. Is your heart still hardened? Is it? 
Do you doubt his ability? Do you compromise your life because you can't wait upon the almighty God, the one who wanted to have a relationship with you so badly that he sent his only son and said, I'm going to permit him to get murdered because I want you for my own. The one who did not spare his own son, shall he not freely give us all things? Can we not trust him? Having eyes. See, because after he asked the question, is your heart still hardened? Still. Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? And by the way, guys, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They knew. One for each. Twelve. And when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And he said, seven. So he said to them, how is it you do not understand? Do you know what's in the next account? An object lesson. The healing of a blind man. Why? Because his disciples see but don't see. His disciples hear but don't hear. And, you know, I might be the guiltiest of all. I could read the Bible in Hebrew. I can read certain sections in Aramaic. I can come work through in the Greek. I can read it through this study Bible and that study Bible, and I can read all these things, but the question is, when the problem arises, do I look at the wind, do I look at the waves, do I look at the storm? Or does Ken Burge go, I look to the one who has been ever faithful, the one who cannot deny himself, the maker of the heavens and the earth, the one who cares for 7, 7 billion people on the planet. Can I not trust him? So number one, prioritize people over tradition, which demonstrates you love God. Number two, challenge others to prioritize people over tradition. Jesus now has been ministering for some time it's the same group that keeps hardening their hearts. But guess what? He keeps trying. He keeps going for their hearts. He's still looking for the converts. If you will, come with me back to Luke 14, verse 5. Then he answered them saying, which of you? Having a donkey, actually the word donkey, it's, it's interesting, the majority of Greek manuscripts have the word son. Just one difference in a Greek letter, but whether a donkey or a son, or an ox that has fallen into the pit, will not, and notice the word there, what? Immediately. Not wait till after the Sabbath. Not wait till Sunday. Not wait till Monday. Will he not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day. Jesus says, you traditionalists, you got to stop slicing the end of the ham. You need to start loving people above tradition. Do you ever notice how the feeding of the 4,000 begins? In Mark chapter 8, Jesus saw the people and he was moved with compassion for them. When was the last time you were moved? When was the last time you wept because of someone's need? When was the last time you were broken because of the co-worker's family that is falling apart? When was the last time you were moved because of all the people that are starving on our planet? When was the last time you were touched because of all the individuals you rub shoulders with every day that are going to hell and you won't change your lifestyle and you won't change God, 
You won't change yourself in order to bring God to those people. In 1 John chapter 3, it says, if you see your brother as need and you close your heart, how does the love of God dwell in you? These individuals had nothing to say in verse 6, and they could not answer him. It literally means an answer against. They were speechless. They were defenseless. They were silent. Because Jesus hid them between the proverbial eyes. He exposed their hard hearts, and they had nothing to say. And can I ask you, is your heart still hardened? Are you innovative when it comes to making money for yourself, but not innovative when it comes to meeting the needs of others? Are you creative when it comes for caring for your own self, and yet don't give a rip that the needs around us are so great? Turn with me in closing, please, to Philippians chapter 2. I want you to meet an original traditionalist. Someone who always sliced the end off of the ham, but he had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ and was forever changed. As you're turning to Philippians chapter 2, Paul is the Pharisee of Pharisees. He was the original religious traditionalist. He was the man who understood the traditions and abided in all of them. Did he learn how to put people above tradition? Did he learn how to demonstrate the love of God by caring for others? And by the way, that's the only way people are really going to see that you love God. By virtue of how you care for others. This is what he says in Philippians 2, not knowing if he's going to be released from prison or not. Verse 17, yes. And if I am being poured out as a drink offering, remember David, who one day said as he was sort of distant from his own homeland, oh, I just want a drink of water from Bethlehem. A few of his mighty men broke through the enemy line, brought him back some water. Well, you talk about being loyal. And David goes, I can't drink this. They risked their lives in order to meet my longing. And he poured it out as a drink offering. Paul says, I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. Essentially because of all of you, Paul says. This is why I'm imprisoned. He said, moreover, I am glad and rejoice with you all for the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. Hmm. Like father, like son. God the Father, a heart of love, sent his son, modeled the heart of the father. The apple didn't fall far from the tree. Would you agree with me? Paul, not the biological, but most certainly the spiritual dad, of Timothy, brought him up in his ways. Actually, when Paul's about to die, he says, I just need Timothy. Timothy, can you come? Verse 19, but I trust, I hope, in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. He had to know how these saints were doing. People that are shepherds love their people and need to know that they're doing well. Need to know. But what does he say about Timothy? And can your spiritual dad say this about you? In verse 20. For I have no one. That's a pretty big list. You know how many people Paul knew? You ever read the end of the book of Romans and all the names? All the associates for decades? He says, for I have no one like soul. Father and Son, one. John chapter 10 and verse 30, Jesus could say, I and the Father are one. Paul and Timothy, one, like sold. Paul said, I can send you Timothy, and he's going to remind you of me. 
For I have no one like sold who will sincerely care for your state. And then what a sad statement. Look at verse 21. He's basically exposing the hard-heartedness of so much of the Christian community. For all seek their own. And by the way, isn't that why we have the enormous debt issues that we have today? Because people keep seeing and they keep wanting and they keep spending what they can't afford. And then when it comes time to meeting someone else's need, they say, I can't help you because I'm in over my head because I'm a greedy Christian with a hard heart. And I want all the here and now gadgets, all the bells and whistles because I care about me. Jesus said you can't have two masters. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know Timothy is proving character. That is a son. As a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come. Like father, God the father, like son. Like spiritual dad, Paul, like spiritual son, Timothy. Hard-hearted, do you yet perceive? Have you not heard all that Jesus has done for you? Have you not noticed with your eyesight the magnitude of things he's provided, is your heart still hard? Would you bow your heads and will you talk?